We said that the basic ideas in calculus, the two big ones being slope of a line, tangent to the curve, and area of a curved region, are all based technically on this concept of limit. It's, it's the, when you get to the frontier of what algebra and arithmetic can do for you, you have to accept this idea of limit. Okay. Now, I know that lots of you have seen a calculus class before because I asked you on the first day and you ra all raised your hand. Okay. So let's remember that we're trying to teach a deeper understanding of the concepts of calculus than you had in your first class, if you in fact had a first class. Okay. So let's remember Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back said to Luke, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's advice to keep in mind when you're trying to learn a deeper understanding of the concepts. Okay? So we're going to talk about some stuff which is pretty fundamental and pretty basic. Not basic in the sense of simple, but basic is in at the very bottom. Okay? And it's tempting to think that uh, because much of what we'll do after this does not involve the stuff that's going on on the basic level, that what we're doing today is irrelevant. And I would disagree with that. What we're doing today is fundamental. Today is a day that we care about fundamentals. So, we're going to build up these concepts from the ground floor. Today's a nice ground floor day. So, this is Yoda, Empire Strikes Back, which, by the way, I saw in the theater. That's how old I am. Okay. So, let's move from Yoda to Zeno, Zeno, Zeno of Elia, uh, who proposed this famous paradox, which is written down in Aristotle's Physics. It says, that which is in locomotion must arrive at the halfway stage before it reaches its goal. So hopefully the camera can pick me up on this. Say that I'm, uh, ready, I'm finished teaching my class and I'm ready to leave. Or maybe I'm not finished, I want to escape. And I'd like to leave the classroom. How can I leave the classroom? Well, I have to get from where I am to the door, which is over there. Now what Zeno is saying is that before I get to the door, I have to get to the spot which is halfway between me and the door, which would be somewhere around here. Okay. So here I am halfway to the door. Uh, am I at the door? No, I'm not at the door. Uh, so I got to keep going towards the door. Zeno says that before I get to the door, I have to get to the spot halfway between where I am and where I want to go, the door. So here I go. I'm going halfway to the door. All right. Here I am now. Am I at the door? No, I'm not at the door. I got to keep going. But before I get there, Zeno says that I have to reach the spot halfway between where I am and the door. So here I go. I'm at a halfway spot. Am I there? No. I have to get to another halfway spot and another halfway spot and another halfway spot. And Zeno says no matter how far I go, I still have this set of halfway spots. There will always be one more halfway spot that I have to cross before I get to where I'm going. And therefore, motion is impossible. I just blew your mind, right? <laughs> Motion is impossible because no matter where I'm going, I still have to get halfway there before I can bother to get there at all. Okay, so how many of you believe Zeno? Nobody? Oh, we got one person who believes that motion is impossible. The rest of you, do you agree or disagree? How many disagree? Empirical evidence suggests that motion is impossible. So what's wrong with Zeno's argument there? Why is it not true that motion is impossible? It is true that that which is in locomotion must arrive at the halfway stage, right? So help me out here. Help me out of this Aristotelian conundrum. Mm. Possibly extending where your goal is? Possibly extending where my goal is? Well, at no point did I change my mind. At no point did I say I'm going somewhere besides the door. Are you saying that if I instead decided to go to the halfway point, I might be able to get to the door? You want to get to the door, but you know you'll have the halfway point. So if you think, what's twice the distance over there? Oh, okay. So I set my sights for a spot which is twice as far away from the door, and then I walk towards that, and I have to get to the halfway point. Ah, but actually, before I get to the halfway point from where I am and where I want to be, I have to get to the halfway point of that. So if the door is halfway where I want to be, between here and my halfway point, there's another halfway point. So I actually stop here. Zeno actually says you can't even get started because there's a half and a half and a half and a half. Uh-huh. Well, maybe instead of arriving at the goal, we approach the goal. We approach the goal? Sounds great, but I don't want to approach the door. I want to get out the door. So how do I get out the door? Uh-huh. 
okay? Human, human motion, you're going to go through the door. It's not like you're going to have, you know, fear or care that for every single goal you set your mind on. Like, once you get through the door, you're going to go past the door again. So you're going to go a half and a half and a half. It's not like your only goal is the door. Okay, so you said something about, uh, about a quarter of the way through what you said. I think you said something about um, once you've gotten close enough, then you're basically there, right? And you can throw Zeno out the window. Do I have that paraphrase well? Ish. Okay, yes. <laughs> Other comments? Think about the time it takes me to tra traverse these halfway points. Is that relevant to the motion? Okay, a few nods. It's not always about where you're going. You don't necessarily have to end up there. No, it's just about, it's just about where you're going or the, dire the direction in which you're headed. Uh -huh. It's about your destination. You don't have to necessarily get there. OK, so as long as I have some forward velocity, I can just keep going. And I don't have to worry about where I'm headed or where, I, where my destination is as long as I just keep going in that direction. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. The halfway points are infinitely small? Yeah, because if you just keep breaking them down, they're tiny. OK, um, I would I ag agree and disagree with you. Uh, it's true that the halfway points are getting smaller, right? The sec this, this first halfway point is halfway to the door. The second halfway point is half of the first halfway point. And the third one is half of the second one, and so on. None of them is infinitely small. They're all finitely small. But they're all smaller than the one before. So that's where I would draw, I, I would make a slight distinction there. You know, we, we math folks, we care about specific words. We like to split hairs. Yeah? Maybe each halfway point is like a freeze frame in time, like a snapshot? A freeze frame in time? Yeah. If so, how, what's the time interval between the first halfway point and the second halfway point compared to the time interval between starting and the first halfway point? Mm -hmm. But then, since motion is continuous across time, well, like, an additional all those freeze frames? Okay, so you took it on faith that motion is continuous across time. And that's actually what Aristotle had to, had to assert in order to get out of Zeno's paradox. He had to say, uh, motion is continuous. And you can divide time as infinitely as you can divide space. So it takes, say it takes one second to get here. It's only going to take half a second to get here, a quarter of a second to get here, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty second. And so you can leave the door in finite time. Thank goodness, right? We wouldn't want to be stuck here forever, would we? OK, so that's the resolution to Zeno's paradox. Now, what does this have to do with math? Well, it sounds very mathematical. What does this have to do with functions? Well, we described a lot of functions there, right? The, my position is a function of time, you know, as I went out the door. And what I was trying to do was have my position function approach a certain value. OK, so that brings us to the basic idea, whoops, the basic idea of the limit, okay? So now we'll write it in a definition form. So here we go. The, we write the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l and say the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l. If we can make the values of f of x arbitrarily close to l, that is as close as we like, by taking x to be sufficiently close to a, but not equal to a. OK. So let's ponder the gravity of this definition for a second here. There is one very important adjective in this definition. What is the most important adjective in the definition here? Yeah? Sufficient. Is sufficient on the, OK, it's sufficiently is on the board, but not sufficient. The reason I make that distinction is that sufficiently is not an adjective. Close. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Close. Close. Close is the key word. Most of the time, people pick uh, something like values or something. They pick something which isn't an adjective at all. But you got it on the second try. Close is the most important adjective. We're talking about the function being close to its perspective limit and x being close to uh, the point, okay? 
Now, as far as sufficiently, that was your first uh, important word. And this is one of two very important adverbs in the definition. How close? Sufficiently close. Okay, what's the other important adverb here? Arbitrarily. Okay. So the idea is that we want to make f of x close to L. How close? Arbitrarily close. That is, as close as necessary to L by taking x sufficiently close to A. Okay? So how would we say that the limit of my position function equals the door if I'm stepping at all these halfway points? Well, how close do you need me to be to the door? Let's say that if I'm within arm's length of the door, then I can leave. Right? I can push the door, get out. So am I, am I there yet? No. Okay, I got to go to another halfway point. Am I there yet? No. <laughs> another halfway point. Am I there yet? Okay, now I'm here. Well, I'm not here, but I'm as close as I need to be to the door in order to get out. And so the limit of my position function uh, as time goes to, I don't know, 2 equals the door. Okay, now that was just one measure of closeness. Maybe uh, I don't want to extend my arm all the way out. I only want to extend it halfway out. Okay, am I there yet? No. Am I there yet? No. Now? No. Now? Okay, well, now I can get out. I changed my arm length here. It took me longer to get there, but I did eventually get that. Okay, now what if I need to be a finger away? Well, I can do that by going a few more half steps. I can finally get that close to the door. Okay, how close do you need to be to that limit? We can get you that close by taking the input to be sufficiently close to this focus point A here. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Now, there's another way to think about this. Uh, I like to play a little game I call the error and tolerance game. So in terms of me walking across the room, error is the amount I needed to be in order to say I was pretty much there. So in the first time, I said that I should be this far. The second time, I said I needed to be half an arm length. And then I said I needed to be a finger length. That amount of separation, I'll call that the error. And the tolerance is how many steps I needed to take to get that close, or how close the input needs to be to that focus point to get there. So let's formulate this between two players. We'll call player one Dana and player two Emerson. Why Dana and Emerson? Well, one advantage is that those are both androgynous names, and you can't accuse me of having a gender bias. Right? Dana and Emerson, they could be boys, they could be girls, who knows? OK, so sure, you know girls and boys named Dana, don't you? Not Emerson. Not Emerson? Any last name can be a first name of either gender. That's the way it works. OK, so step one is that Dana uh, is bold and proposes a certain number L to be the limit of this function as x approaches this point A. OK, so Dana is the optimist, and Emerson's the skeptic. Emerson has to challenge the proposed limit with some error amount, OK? So if we're playing this walk across the room game, Dana is the one who says, I claim that the limit is the door. And Emerson says, all right, well, can you get within an arm's length of the door? OK, well, Dana's job then is to choose a tolerance around A so that the points x within that tolerance, not counting A itself, are taken to values y within the error level. So for walking across the room, the tolerance was how many steps do I need to take in order to say I'm basically there? How basically, uh, as, as much as you want me to be to the door. Okay, if Dana can't do that, then Emerson wins. The limit cannot be this number L that Dana was suggesting. Okay, if Dana uh, can, well then Emerson can choose to challenge again with a smaller tolerance or Emerson can say, all right, I give up, you win, the limit is L. Okay, so there's this interplay between the closeness that f of x needs to be to L and the closeness x is made to A in order to ensure that happening. How does this actually play out on a graph? Well, here is the graph of a function. Okay, here's the graph. And Dana has already decided 
that the limit of this function as x gets closer to a is L. So how does the game play out? Well, that was, step one was Dana proposes the limit, right? Step two is that Emerson says, can you get within this certain amount of that prospective limit L? Okay, and so what Dana is saying is, can you make your y values in this error interval around L? And Dana says, sure, I can do that. All I have to do is restrict my x's to this interval around a. So what Dana is saying is that if the x's are in this interval here, then their y's will be in this interval here. Now how do you find the y corresponding to an x? You look up on the graph. So if this point is your x, you look up, up, oh, this y is in the green interval, so it does count. In order for Dana's move to be a good one, all of the x's within that blue vertical band need to go to y's, which are in this green horizontal band. OK, so you guys are the referees this time. Is it true that all of the x's in the blue horizontal band go to y's, sorry, the blue vertical band, go to y's inside the green horizontal band? No, it's not. Can you see that there are points up here which are, have their x's inside the vertical band, but their y's are outside the horizontal band? OK, so this is not a good move. Referee says, Err. But remember, Dana's the optimist. Dana can try again. So that's too big, too big of a tolerance around A. Dana says, that's fine. I can make a smaller tolerance. Judges? Err, that's still too big. OK. Well, Dana's going to try one more time. This is Dana's third try. What do you think? How many say yes? OK. How many say no? How many don't know? How many don't care? OK, so it's like 12 to nothing. Let's see. We're supposed to check that the x's inside the blue vertical band all go to y's inside the green horizontal band. Well, these are all the function values that we're looking at, right? Are all those function values inside the horizontal band? Yes, they are. So ding, 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 Dana wins this round. Dana's found a tolerance which is suitable for that error. OK, is that Dana's only move? Could Dana have chosen something else, Joe? I'm sorry, you look like a. So you look like a student named Gerald. Um, can you keep the, uh, the other stuff, the right, the right side farms a little bit more? So for more, uh, more space? I could move this, this piece a little bit to the right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And get more points within the farms? Okay, so I could make it a little bit bigger. Could I make it smaller? Yes. Did but you can also change the error. Uh, we're Dana. Dana doesn't handle the error. That's Emerson's job. So once the error is, is done, Dana's got to work with that. Okay. Can Dana choose a bigger error? Yes, he can go move this thing all the way out to maybe here. Okay. He could even move the left-hand side of the error, uh, the tolerance interval, to the left. He can even make it smaller, right? If he's got it once, then he can pick it half as wide, and he's still going to win. Yeah. Um, you can choose the area towards the left where the blue line crosses the green. That's right. If you really wanted to grab as much as you could, you could find the intersection of the no. graph with the horizontal on both sides no, no, and make your. No, no, it all together. Can, can, can you do that? Go on the other, like on. Here? Further on the left. Here? No, no. Oh, oh, I'm, you, can you go can you do that? all the way over here? Yeah. Well, then you're picking up this part of the graph, which is no, definitely no. out. No, no, could you try it one more time, please? Just shift the whole blue rectangle over to, like, not wide enough. Oh, oh. Shift it all together to the other place where. Move, move A over here. Yeah, could you okay. do that? No, I, once the, A is one of the rules of the game. We're trying to define the limit as x goes to A of f of x, so we don't get to move A. Oh, okay. Okay? Yeah. That would be a different game, which we could play. But for the purposes of this game, 
A is sticking where it's at. Okay. All right? Yeah. I'm glad I understood your question. Did you understand my answer? Yeah. Good. Well, we're both happy then. OK, so that's good. You can make it even smaller. All right. Now, the next stage of the game was that Emerson would, would say, well, it's OK that you won my first round, but can you handle this? Can you, if I make the error a little bit smaller, half of what it was before, can you find a tolerance which suits this error? OK, but Dana's figured it out now that half as much as he had before is going to work here as well. Is it true? All of the x's inside the blue interval go to y's inside the green interval. Yeah. OK. And now you can see how this game is going to play out. No matter how thin Emerson chooses that error interval to be, Dana is going to be able to make a thin enough tolerance interval to fit the x's inside the y's. OK. So play this out a few times. Eventually, Emerson is going to have to give up because the limit of this function as x goes to a is l. OK? So let's try an example. Uh, we're not going to play the game with pictures. We'll play it with some numbers. OK. So here's a function defined by a formula, right? Describe how the error intolerance game would be played to determine what the limit is as x goes to 0 of the function x squared. OK. So you guys want to be Dana or do you want to be Emerson? How about you guys be Dana? And tell me what you think the limit of this function is. Limit as x goes to 0 of x squared. Yeah? 0. 0. OK. That is a perfectly good. Uh, proposal. Because after all, if x were exactly equal to 0, then x squared would be exactly 0. All right, so if x is close to 0, maybe x squared should be close to 0 squared, which is 0. OK, but we're going to actually try to play the game. So we need, to, uh, we need Emerson to come up with an error level. Let's say Emerson says we need an error of 0.01. So Emerson says, if you're going to tell me that the limit is x squared, the limit is x goes to 0 of x squared is 0, then you need to find a tolerance to fit the error of 0.01. Okay. Well, you guys are Dana, so I'll, I'll, I'll do your move here. Dana says that, well, if x is less than what, then x squared will be within what? Uh, 0 0.01 of 0. How small does x have to be? You're going to miss the best part. How small does x have to be in order to make sure that x squared is within 0 0.01 of 0? What do you think, Dana's? You have to be incredibly small. Incredibly, but today we have to be precise. How small does x need to be in order to make sure that x squared is less than 0 0.01. Uh -huh. The square root of 0 0.01? The square root of 0 0.01? OK. What's the square root of 0 0.01? I heard a few mumbles, but I didn't hear anyone say it loud enough. 0 0.1. 0 0.1. OK, yes. So if x is less than 0 0.1 and greater than minus 0 0.1, then it is within uh, 0 0.01 of 0. And the square of it will be less than the square of 0 0.1, which is 0 0.01. OK. So Dana wins that round by choosing the tolerance to be equal to 0 0.1 to fit an error of 0 0.01. OK. So far, so good. Is Emerson going to give up? Well, maybe Emerson rechallenges with an error level of 0 0.0001. What would Dana's tolerance be now? OK, now the hint here is that 0 0.001, whoops, 0 0.0001 is 10 to the minus 4. So what should the tolerance be now to match an error of 10 to the minus 4? Uh -huh. 10 to the minus 3. OK. Uh -huh. 10, to minus 2. 10 to the minus 2. How many say 10 to the minus 3? I'm going to vote. How many say 10 to the minus 2? Ha ha, you're both right. Both 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2 will work. If we use the 10 to the minus 2, 
If x is less than 10 to the minus 2, then x squared is less than 10 to the minus 4. If x is less than 10 to the minus 3, what's x squared less than? 10 to the minus 6, which is in fact less than 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so 10 to the minus 6 is closer than we need to be, but that's okay. Nobody said it had to be the largest possible tolerance. We just have to make sure that it, uh, it does fit within the error interval. So both of those will work. I suppose the biggest possible tolerance would be 10 to the minus 2, but like I said, no style points. All right, so do you see maybe how this would keep going if Emerson were to choose um, an error of some number y, what would Dana have to choose in order to fit that error? The square root, right? So as long as Dana chooses a tolerance equal to or less than the square root of the error, Dana can always win. And if Dana could pass this along in a message to Emerson, look, you know, I've enjoyed playing this game with you. However, I think I can win no matter what you choose. Emerson is going to have to say, okay, well, I give up. All right? And concede that the limit is zero. So graphically, here's what's going on. Remember the graph of the squared function is touched down. Here we go. And we're trying to look at what's happening to the function as x goes to zero. Dana says the limit as x goes to zero is zero. Emerson says, all right, smart guy or, or gal, can you fit your function values within this error interval? And Dana says, sure, no problem. Uh, I just pick my x's to be within this tolerance interval. You see that if the x's are inside the vertical band, then the y's are inside the horizontal band. Okay. Emerson says, well, what if I pick something smaller? Dana says, no problem. I can pick something smaller still, and so on and so forth. So no matter how far Emerson goes, Dana is able to match that error interval and win the game. Okay? So Dana, uh, Dana wins the game this time around. Questions about that? Okay. So is it all as easy as this? Well, let's look at some other examples. Let's look at the function absolute value of x divided by x and consider the limit of that as x goes to 0. Okay. Now, I snuck in absolute value on the last slide back here, didn't I? Where was it? There it is. Okay, what does absolute value mean? Absolute value is a way of measuring the distance between a point and 0. And distance is always going to be non-negative. Another way to think about absolute value is that it's the function which takes its input and makes it positive. So you can define, uh, redefine the function piecewise like this. If x is greater than 0, then the absolute value of x equals x. And the quotient of the absolute value of x and x would just be the quotient of x and x, which would be 1. If x is less than 0, then the absolute value of x is minus x. Wait a minute. I thought absolute value couldn't be negative. Exactly. If x is less than 0, minus x is greater than 0, and we have made this number positive. So if x is less than 0, absolute value of x is minus x, quotient of minus x and x is negative 1. So this function could also be written as 1 if x is positive, negative 1 if x is negative. And what if, when x is 0? Well, when x is 0, we can't actually plug in anything here because we're dividing by 0. In fact, you could say that the point of this problem is to figure out what the best possible value for 0 would be. Okay? If we were to, find, to define a value of this function when x goes to 0, what would it be? Well, let's try the limit and see if there's something reasonably suggested. Okay. So that's our function. Let's look at the limit of the uh, graph of the function. It's 1 when x is greater than 0. It's negative 1 when x is less than 0. And we don't know what it is when x equals 0. OK. So one of our players here is Dana. One of them is Emerson. Let's see how the error and tolerance game can uh, roll out. Question? Um, if x were 0, wouldn't it just be like 0 over 0 is 0? So wouldn't there be a solid dot in the very middle? 0 over 0 is 0? Yes. Well. Dividing by 0, remember, is not defined, right? Even when the numerator is 0, 
We're not sure how to divide it by zero. Yes. So in fact, limits are basically a way to make sense out of the idea of dividing by zero. Okay? If we were to find a limit, then we could say, in this case, the quotient would be 3 or whatever. Okay? So th this is what's going on behind the scenes when we try to divide by 0. Okay, so I think Dana's on the left here. Yeah. Dana's going to say, I think the limit is 1. So Dana has drawn uh, a line here across 1 because he has decided, ever the optimist, that the limit as x goes to 0 of f of x is 1. Okay, what's Dana going to do? Oh, that's Dana. What's Emerson going to do? Emerson's going to say, okay, smart guy, can you find, uh, can you fit your function values within this horizontal band, in this error band? Okay. Well, let's see. Dana's going to try. Dana is going to make this interval, tolerance interval, around zero. And now you guys are the judges. Does Dana win or lose here this round? No, right? Not going to work because why? Because what? Be yeah, because we've got function values down here. They're supposed to be in the green. Are these in the green? No, they're not. Okay, so no good, right? So Emerson says, nope, you've got part of the graph inside the blue vertical, which is outside the green horizontal. Okay. Well, Dana looks ahead and says, basically, I, I could try to make this smaller, but it's not going to change the fact that I have some piece of the graph which is outside the green. No amount of shrinking this vertical interval like it would before is going to work to get rid of what's there. So Dana reluctantly gives up and says, I guess the limit is not going to be 1 here. Okay? But that doesn't mean he quits. That doesn't mean that he says that you know, he's not going to give up the game completely. He's going to change his mind and say, well, I think the limit might be negative 1. Okay, but maybe you can see where this is going to go. What's going to happen next? Okay, so, so Dana Emerson can say, how about this horizontal interval? Okay, and you can see that this is the same problem uh, upside down, right? If the error is down here, no matter what tolerance Dana picks, he's still going to have some part of the graph which is outside the green horizontal band. Okay, so limit cannot be negative one either. Are there any other choices? I don't know. What about zero? Maybe Dana thinks that the limit is going to be zero. If Dana picks zero, then Emerson can say, how about this interval? Can you find uh, an interval around zero which confines your function values to this interval? And well, now this is worse than before, right? Because now there's nothing uh, of the graph that's inside the horizontal band. Okay? So that doesn't work at all. All right, so at this point, Dana really does have to give up and say there is no limit for this function as x goes to 0. Okay, so wah, 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 no limit here. The wonderful thing about mathematics is that when the answer to a question is no, you can usually change the question so the answer is yes. Okay, not you guys, but the people creating mathematics, if, they're, if they pose a question, and the answer is no, then there might be another question for which the answer is yes. And what that means is that we can change the definition ever so slightly so that maybe the answer would be yes instead. What we're going to do then is say the limit as x goes to a from the right equals l. If we can make the values of f of x arbitrarily close to l uh, by taking x to be sufficiently close to a and greater than a. Okay? And you see that we've decorated the limit there with a little plus to say we're taking the limit from the positive side. Not, not, we're not saying that A is necessarily positive. We're saying that we approach A from the positive direction. Because if you look at this graph, it's nice on this side. Okay? And it's nice on this side. It's really just the problem of being undecided between the two that is making this limit not exist. So we'll come up with this idea of limit from the right. And then any time you've got a right hand, you've got a left hand, so you can get a limit from the left. That's another thing mathematicians like to do is create one definition just by changing a few words in another definition. So you can have a limit from the left 
by taking the values of x arbitrarily close to L, uh, by taking x to be sufficiently close to A and less than A, and then we decorate it with the minus sign. So two new um, related ideas of limits from one side or the other. And now if you look at the same graph, you're playing the same game, except the tolerance intervals that, you are, that Dana gets to use don't extend to both sides of A. They only extend to the right side of A. So if Dana, Dana can choose a tolerance interval which looks like this. And now if you look, are all the function uh, x's inside the blue interval uh, having y's inside the green interval? And the answer is yes. Right? There's all the graph inside the blue is also inside the green. Okay? And no matter how small Emerson makes this ver uh, horizontal band, Dana's going to be able to shrink this enough to keep that graph inside. Okay? So that's good news because that means we can, the limit from the right of this function is the value 1. Okay? And you could do it from the left as well. The limit from the left of this function uh, is the value negative 1. Okay. So no limit, period, but we can take limits from the right and limits from the left. And that's almost as good. So error tolerance game fails this time. But if we change the question slightly and ask what's the limit from the right and the limit from the left, then we can say those limits do exist. Okay. So the answer was no, but we changed the question to make the answer yes. All right? Okay. So we looked at some limits uh, where the limit did exist. We look at some other functions where the limit doesn't exist. Let's try another one here. Find the limit as x goes to 0 from the right of 1 over x if it exists. Okay. When we found the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared, we got a good guess by plugging in 0. right? Uh, can we plug in 0 here? Oop. A new version of Java? I was waiting for a new version of Java. That's all right. This is OK. So is there a limit? Well, let's find out. Here's a graph of the function. This is f of x equals 1 over x. Sure. Remember, when x is small, uh, when x is large, 1 over x is small. When x is small, 1 over x is large. OK, so Dana is going to pick some limit. Let's just pick one uh, line here. And Emerson's job is to challenge that prospective limit. Emerson says, can you confine the graph inside this green horizontal interval uh, by taking a vertical band which extends to the right of 0. Okay? We're only doing the limit from the right. So the left-hand side will be 0. The right-hand side will be something. Okay. Well, how about that? Judges? No, because we've got this part of the graph outside the green. Okay. Well, Dana's only move is to try to shrink the graph, or shrink the, the uh, vertical band. Does this work? No, this is actually worse, because the part of the graph inside the blue is all the way up here. We can't even see it. Okay. So does that mean that Dana picked a bad limit? Well, I didn't tell you what this limit was. If I had moved the limit up a little bit, it would basically be the same problem. No matter how, uh, what number you wanted, Dana isn't going to be able to confine the graph within any interval around that function value. Okay? So that's not going to work. The technical aspect of this function is that it's unbounded near <coughs> the point zero. Uh-huh. That's right. If, if we wanted to look instead over here, well, that's a different question. That would be the limit as x goes to 1, oh. let's say, of the function. And that wouldn't be a problem. Okay. okay? But there is a problem when x is 0. So Dana can, can change the question and talk about right and left-hand limits, but he can't change the point at which we're looking at the limit. And the point we're looking at the limit is 0. And this looks bad, right? So what do we do? Well. If the answer is no, we change the question and the answer is yes. Next week, we'll look at an affirmative answer 
we'll be able to say that the limit as x goes to 0 from the right hand side of 1 over x is positive infinity. Okay? But let's, let's delay that till next week. This week, let's just con um, satisfy ourselves by saying that this limit does not exist. Okay? No limit because the function is unbounded. Okay. So what else can go wrong? Well, let's take a look at this function here. We'll find the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of pi over x. OK. Now, if you just stare at the expression for this function, what you'll see is that, um, well, you can't just plug in 0, because then you try to divide pi by 0. And you know we can't divide by 0. So there's no uh, answer to be gleaned just by plugging in here. Uh, so we have to look instead about what happens to values of this function as x gets close to 0. Okay. Now, if you're rusty on sine, or even if you're not, it helps with this problem to make a unit circle and think about values of the sine. Remember that if you start from here and you trace an angle theta, then the sine of that angle theta is the vertical distance above the x-axis. Okay? And the cosine is the horizontal, but we don't care about cosine right now. So if I take whatever I'm plugging into sine, which in this case is pi over x, if pi over x were equal to pi, then the sine of pi over x would be 0, because we'd be going halfway around the unit circle, and now we are a vertical distance of 0 from the x-axis. So the sine of pi is 0, right? Okay. What other angles have a sine equal to 0? 2 pi. There's 2 pi. 2 pi represents going all the way around the circle uh, and ending up back where you started. We are a distance of 0 above or below the x-axis here. Make sense? OK. Any other values that you could think of? 3 pi. 3 pi, yeah. Any others? 4, four pi. <laughs> what? Eight 7 pi, 8 pi. In fact, you could take negative multiples of pi as well. You'd just be going around in the opposite direction. Okay. Any multiple of pi is going to land you either on the right side or the left side, and you are right on the x-axis, and that means that there's no uh, sine, okay, sine of 0. Okay, so if the angle is pi or 2 pi or any multiple of pi, then the sine is going to be 0. Now, what x values are going to make that happen? For which x is pi over x equal to pi? 1. For which x is pi over x equal to 2 pi? 1 half. For which x is pi over x equal to k pi? 1 over k. One over k. No, 1 over k. Okay. So if x is 1 or 1 half or 1 third or 1 fourth or negative 1 half or negative 1 third or negative 1 fourth, then sine of pi over x is going to be 0. And what about these points 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, 1 seventh? Where are those points getting close to? Those are getting close to 0. So this function has infinitely many points arbitrarily close to 0 where the function takes the value 0. Now, that's a lot of uh, arbitraries and sufficients, but what that means is that if the limit of this function exists, then it would have to be 0, because it hits 0 infinitely many times, no matter how close you look at 0. OK, but we know that that's not the end of the story of sine. right? We can also get the sine equal to 1 by taking the angle of pi over 2. All right, if you start here, go 90 degrees, which is pi over 2 radians, then you are a full distance 1 above the x-axis. OK, so if pi over x is pi over 2, then sine of pi over x is 1. What other angles will have their sine equal to 1? Yeah? 2 pi over 4? That's basically the same number as pi over 2, though. OK? 3 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 is good. Um, it's not on my table, though. Well, actually, 3 pi over 2? Where's 3 pi over 2? That was a sign of negative 1. Hold that thought. 
5 pi over 2. There we go. So 5 pi over 2 is once around and then another pi over 2, right? 2 pi plus pi over 2. This is Pete Townsend doing trigonometry here. 2 pi plus <laughs> pi over 2. And that gives you another clue for the next one, right? You can go 4 pi plus pi over 2, and that would be what? 9 pi over 2, OK? What would be the next one? 13 pi over 2. In fact, all you have to take is four, a multiple of 4 and add 1 times pi over 2, right? Because this is 0 plus 1, 4 plus 1, 8 plus 1. The next one would be 12 plus 1. Or negative 4 plus 1 would be negative 3 pi over 2. That would be going around this much. Or negative, what, negative 3 plus another, negative 7 pi over 2. OK? All of these angles are going to have a sign of 1. OK? Now, which x's will correspond to those angles? Well, pi over 2 is pi over 2. What would x have to be to make pi over x equal to 5 pi over 2? 2 over 5, yeah. What would x have to be to make pi over x equal to 9 pi over 2? 2 ninths. This is why we put fractions on the placement test. Right? What would x have to be in order to make pi over x equal to 4k plus 1 over 2 times pi? 2 over 4k plus 1. Okay? Any k, any integer k or whole number k that we want is going to give me an x for which f of x is 1. Now what happens to these points, uh, 2, 2 fifths, 2 ninths, 2 thirteenths, 2 seventeenths, 2 twenty-firsts, negative 2 sevenths, negative 2 elevenths, uh, what are those points clustering around? Zero. Those are clustering around 0 again. So what that means is that you have infinitely many points arbitrarily close to 0 where the function takes the value 1. And that means that the limit of this function as x goes to 0, if it were to exist, it would have to equal 1. OK? Is, is, that, is that good? Is that congruent or discongruous with anything we have said before? We said that if the limit existed, it would have to be 0. And then we said if the limit existed, it would have to be 1. OK. Now, what other values are famous for sine? If you go to pi, 3 pi over 2, the sine is negative 1. OK, but you can see where this is going. We don't have to go just to 3 pi over 2. We can go once around and then to 3 pi over 2. That would be 7 pi over 2. We can go around twice and then once around. It would be 11 pi over 2. Any number you want, take that multiple of 4, subtract 1, multiply by pi over 2, and that's going to be an angle where the sine is negative 1. So 3 pi, 7 pi, 11 pi, all these divided by 2. 15 pi over 2, 19 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, negative 5 pi over 2, negative 9 pi over 2. All those points, will, all those angles will have their signs equal to negative 1. Well, what x's will give you these angles? How would you get 3 pi over 2? Take, plug in x equals 2 thirds. How would you get 7 pi over 2? Plug in x equals 2 sevenths. How would you get 4k minus 1 times pi over 2? Plug in 2 over 4k minus 1. And how about these points? 2 thirds, 2 sevenths, 2 elevenths, 2 fifteenths, 2 nineteenths, negative, uh, negative 1 half, negative, uh, let's see, 2 fifths, negative 2 ninths. What are those all clustering around? Zero. So we have infinitely many points arbitrarily close to zero where the function takes the value negative 1. OK, and now this is really bad. Because the limit, if it exists, by virtue of these would have to be equal to 0. By virtue of these would have to be equal to 1. By virtue of these would have to be equal to negative 1. So f of x is 0 whenever x is 1 over some number k, some integer k. f of x is 1 when x is 2 over 4k plus 1. And x is negative 1 when x is 2 over 4k minus 1. OK, now these are technicalities here. The thing I want you to really understand is that we get lots and lots of points, as many as we want, as close as we want to 0, where the function must be 0.
We get as many points as we want, as close as we want to zero, where the function takes the value one. We get as many points as we want, as close as we want to zero, where the function takes the value minus one. And this means that the function really has no place to coalesce to a limit. Okay. So what would a graph of this function look like? Well, it would have to be oscillating up and down, because it's the sign. But between what values? Well, between 1 and negative 1. And we know that it's going to hit 1 and hit negative 1 and hit 0 infinitely many times, no matter how close I get to 0. Here's a graph of the function. Okay? So it starts out nice. But as x gets smaller, pi over x gets larger. So the frequency of the sign increases the closer I get to 0. So here you see the points where it crosses the x-axis. Here's the place where this is a half, this is a third, this is a fourth, this is a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and so on. These places where it uh, reaches its maximum, these are the, uh, what were those points? Two-fifths, two-ninths, two-thirteenths, and so on. And then these are the points two-sevenths, two-elevenths, two-fifteenths, uh, and so on there. Okay? Now, it looks a little bit jagged, and that's because this is still plotted by a computer, and the computer can only approximate so much. But basically what you would see is no matter how close you got to zero, you would still see infinitely many crossings of the x-axis, infinitely many peaks, and infinitely many values, no matter what resolution you looked at. And so that's about as bad as a limit can be. All right? it's, not, uh, it's not infinity. It's not something different from the le right and left. It's something completely insane, right? Weird, wild stuff. Okay, the good news is that this is not going to happen to you very often. Most of the time, with uh, functions that we are defining in terms of formulas, we will see uh, usually a function will have a limit, or if it doesn't have a limit, we'll probably be able to take a limit from one side or the other, and or the other, uh, or we might see infinite limits. Or you could have something really strange like oscillation with increasingly high frequency. That's what's going here. It's oscillating, but the closer you get to zero, the faster it is oscillating. OK. So questions so far? You guys are doing great. All right. So now I feel like I should tell you something, and that's that um, Dana and Emerson were not creations of Newton and Leibniz, right? They, they weren't the ones who came up with the error and tolerance game. Um, in fact, the error and tolerance game were invented by this guy, Augustine Louis Cauchy. Okay? And he was a Frenchman from the, let's see, 18th to 19th century. So what century are we talking about for Newton? What century is Newton? Okay, slightly easier question. What years were Newton around? The blank hundreds? Sixteen hundreds, very good. Sixteen hundreds is which century? Seventeenth century. Okay? So roughly two hundred years after Newton was the first real formulation of the idea of limit. Okay? Well, how did Newton do calculus without limits? Well, he had his own special ideas for these uh, concepts, but basically, uh, he just sort of swept it under the rug. Okay? Leibniz, as well, had his special ideas about limits. He expressed them in terms of what he called infinitesimals. So to Leibniz, an infinitesimal is a number which is smaller than any positive number, but larger than zero. Let me say that again. An infinitesimal is a number which is smaller than any positive number, but larger than zero. Okay? And this little dx that you see in calculus uh, expressions, that was one of Leibniz's infinitesimals. Now, what's the matter? We, we don't have any numbers which are smaller than all positive numbers and bigger than zero. Okay? You can invent them. There is a consistent logical framework that includes these infinitesimal numbers. Uh, but instead, we use the, uh, the idea of limit to think about this arbitrary closeness and sufficient closeness. Okay? So what else about Cauchy? I told you that he was the first guy to write down this definition of the limit. OK, he didn't actually invent the game, but the basic concept was there. The really remarkable thing is that he used his definition, which we still use today and believe is a very good definition, to prove theorems which are not true. Okay? So Cauchy had the good definition, 
but he himself didn't even understand it. So in the history of mathematics, the things which are hard to mathematics students were also hard to mathematics, mathematicians in general. Okay? And Newton and Leibniz didn't quite understand limits. Cauchy understood them a little bit, but not enough to do his own homework in limits. Okay? Now, what exactly did Cauchy use for his definition of the limit? It looked something like this, although he probably wrote it in French. So here is the precise definition of the limit. And just to help you relax a little bit, this kind of Greek mathematics is not going to be tested, but it is worthwhile to learn. Let f be a function defined on some open interval that contains the number a, except possibly at a itself. This is what we were saying before. We say that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l, and we write the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l. If for every epsilon greater than 0, there is a corresponding delta greater than 0, such that if the 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. What the hell? <laughs> Well, if you compare this to what we were talking about before with arbitrary closeness and sufficient closeness, is there anything that resembles this? Well, remember we said that absolute value is what we use to measure distance. Okay? So to say that f of x is close to L is the same as saying that the absolute value of f of x minus L is a small number. Okay? How small did we want to make the absolute value of f of x minus L? How close did we want to make f of x to L? Remember? arbitrarily close. Arbitrarily close is this epsilon here. For every epsilon greater than zero. How close do you need f of x to be to L? Okay, and then what's the next step? Well, we need to make x close enough to A in order to ensure this inequality holds. So the delta here is the sufficient closeness that x has to be to A in order for this to be true. Okay, so choose some arbitrary error amount, epsilon. Then there must be a corresponding tolerance amount, delta, such that if x is within a, or if x is within the tolerance amount of a, then y is within the error amount of l. So here's the picture. If you propose that the limit is l, then for any epsilon, you need to be able to, find, uh, to confine your function values within this epsilon interval around L. Okay? And what you get to do is choose a delta interval around A in hopes that if x's are within this delta interval, then y's are within this epsilon interval. Is it true in this case? No, it's not. Right? That's delta is too big, we've got values which are uh, points x for which their y's are not within epsilon of L. Okay? We shrink it up a little bit, now we can do it. If x is within this delta of A, then y is within this epsilon of L. Okay? And we could shrink it even further, that would still be good. Okay? So if, even if we shrunk this, we would still be able to find the good delta. So the error in tolerance game really is Cauchy's epsilons and deltas. Okay? So no, I'm not going to make you write Greek on the test, but I think this idea of one, uh, the function trying to be made arbitrarily close by taking x sufficiently close is the key to understanding how limits actually work. Okay? So we have lots of ways to look at limits. And graphically, you can think about where the graph is going, right? and that's probably going to be the limit of the function. We have our heuristic definition f of x can be made arbitrarily close to a, uh, l by taking x sufficiently close to L, a. We have this nice informal error and tolerance game to play out and think about limits. And then there's the exact precise definition, um, which would require the Greek letters. OK, and next time, what we will look at is algebraic ways to find limits in special cases. OK, and that is it for today.